Your Highness, my Lord, ladies and gentlemen, it really is an honour to be here this afternoon at an equine forum. One of my colleagues, when I was chatting to them yesterday, said, are you, you sure? They do know you're not an equine physio, but a human physio. So it, it actually is, for me, uh, on the back of these two talks, really, really appropriate to uh, really took a, a look at rider fitness. I took on this role with uh, British Equestrian a year ago, coming out of, I, I, I'm a, a social, social rider, um, but I've worked with many sports. And one of my real interests is how we optimize performance, without a doubt. I'm very, very performance orientated, but very much about how do we look at fundamental movement patterns in various sports and how we look at increasing performance. And clearly, in our world, we haven't got just one athlete. And in fact, if, if I have a pound for every time someone says, well, why are you bothering with the riders when it's all about the horse, is still absolutely fundamentally a belief in, in some quarters, which to me is really, really surprising. And what I want to discuss with you this afternoon is take you on a little bit of a journey of the last year of what we are trying to do to really challenge the thought as to what does rider fitness mean. Um, I don't find a lot of evidence where it is based on what impact does that rider fitness have on the horses and most importantly, what does it have on performance. And we want to look at clearly a model in world class, but really my drive is looking at we should be and, and listening to some of the talks this morning about horse welfare, there's a lot of evidence and, and I'll certainly be talking around some of the core stability and the impact that rider dysfunction has on the horses and I think particularly on their core stability and therefore leads to a whole lot of range of issues is really what I want to explore and what I want to try and change. So if we look at, um, for me, the fundamental, the hypothesis that I'm putting out this afternoon is fundamental movement supports specific movement. And there's a real belief that you can get fit by riding a horse. And if that was the case, evaluating the riders that I've evaluated at the top end, um, there's still really big issues with respect to some of their alignment and, and issues around fitness. So when the building blocks are not in place, very similar to what we talk about, the building blocks of, of in, the, in our equine side of things, the riders will compensate by developing poor biomechanical habits to continue performing a skill. And this I absolutely know. I've now looked at, um, assessed 65 riders across podium, podium potential, and also our, our lower podium pathway. And this is fundamentally, we have some issues in how they develop. A very famous Bruce Lee, uh, when, when, when people challenge me about, well, you can still ride, is Bruce Lee was very one of the forefathers of talking about you've got to have flexibility and strength in order to do your skill. And absolutely, I think that is, is something that, um, as I take you through this afternoon, uh, you'll see there's some gaps in that. So if we, if we look at the slide on the left-hand side, or the picture on the left-hand side, um, Rachel's already spoken around the core stability of the horse, but this is, for me, the hindquarters and how the hindquarters are brought in from a rider is very important in obviously what the seat of the rider is doing. But what influences that seat? And that's what I'm trying to determine with, with doing some movement assessments, and we'll go into that in detail in a moment, is to how do we know what exercises and what weaknesses in the rider affect that sling system there and therefore affect what the horse is doing. Your second, your green line coming through there is very much around um, the connection, obviously what the horse is doing, but really around the weight and around what the leg is doing. So therefore what's happening around the hip and around the pelvis. But to my knowledge, there's been no work done is how do you separate it out so that the work we're doing off the horse is going to make a difference to what we're trying to do on the horse. And if we then look at what a rider, a, a, definition of rider fitness is, I think that we'll start to be able to quantify it. And for me, it's always around giving evidence. It's not about anecdotal. And I've spoken to many coaches, many riders, that there's some wisdom coming around the, the tens, hundreds of years, but actually not backed up with actually, if we're going to do something better off the horse, what is it that we're going to do to be more effective? So the key biomechanical components, and I'll break this, this down, is clearly we want as a rider, we want to have mobility through the hips. That's absolutely no different to us as we function as, as human beings, not just riders, but as we walk around. Our joints in the ankle are designed to be mobile. Our hips are designed to be mobile. Stability around the knee joint. If we then go further up, you should have stability. We all know about core stability through our trunk, both front and back, and the lateral aspects of our trunk. The thoracic spine needs to be mobile. Very, very similar to what we, need, what we see in a horse. And then again, when we go up here, we need more stability around the cervical spine. 
and that relates very nicely. So when I'm starting to do movement profiles with, horse, with horses, with riders, off the horses, we need to bear both of these in mind and how they impact on the horse. And the really interesting thing, if we look at the riders that I've screened to date, is most of them have very, very, very stiff thoracic spines. They have, surprisingly, I thought I'd find more stiffness through the hips, but actually not. But what we're finding is if you transfer this mobility area to something that's becoming rigid, that becomes a massive driver in how you transfer load through the saddle. And our age to the seat, as we know, whether you're a show jumper, whether you're a dressage, whether you're a three-day eventer, para dressage is absolutely paramount. And what we're trying to do is really line it up to, again, how that impacts on the horse's function. So if we look about here in a, in a show jumper, stiffness through these areas here, as I've said, absolutely crucial that we need to address that. Speaking to David earlier, we've done an injury and illness audit of riders, and there's a huge increase in knee issues. And I think the reason for that, if, if I look about the 60-odd riders that I've screened, is because they lack mobility through the ankle. So what happens is you need to get more shearing through the knee in order to compensate for a lack of mobility lower down. And for the sake of today, really what I want to focus on is the rider fitness with respect to balance, so alignment, how they set up, strength and mobility. The aerobic fitness we can come to a little bit later, but this is for me really key. And this is where I'm seeing, with respect to uh, the case studies that we're doing, a huge performance impactor on how horses move and what we are obviously linking it to is performance outcome, because that's what we're here to do. So on the slide, you'll see that we have a profile. And what I spent is I spent about eight months working and observing and trying to decide, well, what do we, it's no use profiling hundreds and hundreds of exercises. So you want to be, you want to use something which is valid, reliable, and that's going to give you an outcome that's going to be reflective of, if we change this, if we put something in place to correct that, is that going to have an impact? So a lot of our riders have gone through this. It's standardized, so we have a setup that, uh, as I said in the start of the talk, it's important that this is not just at the world class end. What we want to do, and we all know with greater numbers, is ideally what we want to look at is our young riders coming through. They're not difficult exercises, so it's not prohibitive in that we're putting loads of load through our riders. A rider doesn't have to, and some of the riders that I've worked with have done loads of Olympic lifts. Why do we have to do massive loading with riders? They don't need to. They need to enable their horses, and they need to not be the constraining factor in the horse's ability to move, and that's probably the biggest driver of looking at these. So you'll see we look at some lower body strength markers. And really what I want to, if, if I come back again in two years' time and present some of this data, what I hope I'll be able to do is be able to really start to, at the moment we've got about 15 different tests. My experience with other sports is we start fairly broad and normally you can start to really focus down and look at maybe five or six tests that become really reliable. And most importantly, if I'm saying that you need to be able to do a single leg squat, you need to be able to have good thoracic rotation. You need to have good strength through your hip areas. And that makes a difference when we've aligned it to what the horse is doing when we do gait analysis, what perhaps in a performance, if you're a dressage rider and your half pass to left is continually the score that is low, that's what we're looking to change. And we can only do it by starting to develop something that is standardized, something that is shared across the system. So it's not um, early in some of the talks where we talk about transparency. This is about transparency, and this is shared information. The more of us are starting to use it and the greater awareness we have in fundamental movement patterns of riders, I think the, the, the better and quicker we'll be able to evolve this. So this is an example of, of one of our riders has gone through. What we do is we have a, we have a, a red, amber, green. And red is not, it's not about beating someone with a stick and saying you're absolutely useless. But what we do need to do is we do need to have some kind of an idea of what do we, what do we establish as good and what is world class and what do we think is really suboptimal. And for me, it's always the manner in which we do this. You do not have to make someone embarrassed because a lot of our riders that we're working with are our top, top riders. So it's about looking for, if you've also got 20 minutes to work on something, let's work on the areas that's suboptimal and that we think will have an impact on what perhaps some of your performance limitations are. So you'll see for me probably one of the, the really interesting, when we talk about, um, and really what I want to try and develop as well, that coaches start to use this, is this is a, a, an overhead squat, not with a load. All of us in this room should be able to do that exercise, no matter what age. 
And if you have a look at this rider here, you can see quite a significant stiffness. And if you consider that's without load, that's without any, any activity at all, but yet that's having quite a significant impact on the ability to do this movement. So what's happening when you do repeated movements on a horse? And then when you start to look to break that down and you use performance analysis to see, well, perhaps when they're jumping or when they're doing uh, a venting course, how does that affect them? Do they have an issue with that left leg aid? And is the horse then running out on the, on the left repeatedly? And that's what we're trying to do is tie that in to what we see in a testing to what's happening uh, in the field. And by collecting this and having some kind of a standardized marker, it was really interesting when we first did it and we started with, with, with a load, so a technical level of, of riders that perhaps weren't that good or developing. And it is interesting, and our podium riders, and one of the uh, your Royal Islands, we were talking about it earlier, about um, the biggest concern I have is because the riding schools are less and because we have less licensing, and I think that the standard of riding coming through is much lower. And you have uh, coaches who don't have the same skills. So what I've seen really interesting is our older riders, our riders who've gone through a system and have sustained that level, that high, high level of performance, are showing really good scores as opposed to some of our younger riders. And that's not a case. I mean, some of these younger riders, we talk about 20, 21, so they're not kids. And that is a concern. And that is why I think it's absolutely imperative that we start to do this work because what we do see is the impact on the horse. So again, this is not about, uh, one of the reasons why it's really important to be at an equine forum is because this is not just what, in, coming into the sport, it was really siloed. You had the human physio on one side, never spoke to the equine physio, barely spoke to the vet, really didn't speak to the coaches. And now what we do is we have a system where, let's do gait analysis on the horse. Let's see if there are any underlying issues, instability and clearly any pathological issues. Once you've done that gait analysis, we then look at, does that change when the rider goes on? And what we absolutely have the ability to do is look at saddle pressures. Now, that's new science that's out there, and really importantly, that we don't jump to conclusions. And that's why it's important to keep collecting the data in a longitudinal way, and we keep coming back. And now, as a team, we'll have the riders come in. We'll look at, over here, what the judge, what a technical aspect is, where their low scores, what do we pick up as an equine physio, as a human physio, as vets and as coaches. And this is becoming really, really meaningful because it is performance-focused problem solving, which hopefully will help to then inform riders coming through in the bigger picture. So a really nice example, if you have a look here, this is position analysis. Um, and we very quickly get to, is it the horse? Is it the saddle? Is it the rider? And in this particular case, you can see what's happening with the side bend. If you then start looking at some tests, that for you who don't know is a, is a single leg squat, and it should be really aligned. You should have no drifting of the knee in and you should be able to go to 90 degrees. And you can see that rider has very poor control. And if we have a look in the test that we did for their lateral abdominals, their stability muscles, like we look at horses, were very poor. And what we then do is, if our theory is right, and that's what we're in the, in the early stages of doing, is a bespoke intervention strategy. We've cleared the horse, and we know that what, what the horse is, is able to function is good, but we know the rider is definitely impacting because of where that horse inhibits through the multifidus and through some of those muscles that Rachel's spoken to you this afternoon. And by putting something in place, we then go back, re-monitor, and what we want to see is, are the physios saying, well, that horse is less sore behind the saddle. That horse is moving better. That horse is able to cope more with the workload, as David's spoken about. So it's about insight. It's about getting ideas as a team, intervention, and most importantly, what has the impact been of that intervention? And we have to close that loop in order to really make clear decisions about is this actually going to be something? I, you know, I, I might look at it and think, well, actually, that was the wrong test to do. I'm hoping not, but the clear early indications show us that we're on the right track with what we're doing as an intervention. I'll very quickly touch on this around breathing. And remember that first slide I showed you when we were talking about the alignment of getting the horse's rear quarters and, and the rear end working? Really important is I do a lot of focus on breathing. And out of 60 riders, 48 of them had got dysfunctional breathing. And what I mean by that is not pathological, it's because of rigidity through the thoracic spine. And if you are tight to your breathing, that will absolutely impact on what you're trying to do with a horse. Very quickly, these are the key strength components that I think riders need and what have been probably the biggest limiters to date in the work that we've done. And if we 
very quickly go on to an area which is uh, very dear to my heart, which is about weight. There's been some good studies around rider weight and the load, and that, of course, in, as we know, 75% of our horses that are not affiliated to any organization. And how do we get this information that the, the heavier the riders, there's good studies that have been done around the same rider taking extra 10 pounds, 20 pounds, 40 pounds. The impact on the horse has been absolutely phenomenal with respect to their suspension phase, which is much shorter, and their standing phase, which is much longer. And that makes absolutely complete sense to me. And if you're talking about that in a performance point of view, what impact does that have when you're going over huge, huge obstacles? And what I think happens with the riders is absolutely an, an inhibition of those muscles, the very muscles that Rachel spoken to you earlier. And that's what I, why I think we have to do these interventions. Uh, part of the interventions is very much around specific and what we've developed for each discipline is actually these are specific areas you need to work. Slightly different, but actually if we look at rider fitness specific to each and every discipline, I think that will be impactful. And finally, it really is, uh, for me, what I often hear is people say, we've always, we've always done it this way, Ash, we've done it for 80 years, we've done it for 100 years. We have to think differently, and most importantly, we have to pull together us as a, as a human science, as an equine science, to do a better job for our horses, without a doubt, and to optimise performance. Thank you very much.